Good afternoon, everyone. It's wonderful to see such a such a great crowd um, for this um, second in our Book of Lunchtime series. Um, as some of you will know, uh, I'm Alika Verma, and I'm acting director of, of Torch, a wonderful Oxford Research Centre in the Humanities, where we promote and encourage and support interdisciplinary research and wider engagement with the humanities. Today's discussion is part of the lunchtime series, and uh, we'll be announcing uh, what the next uh, book at lunchtime is uh, at the end, so that you can also look forward to that. We've got some really great books lined up this term. And today, we are very, very pleased uh, to be discussing Peter Frankel Pan's magical new book, uh, The Silk Roads. Peter Frankel Pan is director of the Oxford Centre for Byzantine Research and Senior Research Fellow at Worcester College. He specialises in the history of the Byzantine Empire in the 11th century and in the history, the wide history of Asia Minor, Russia and the Balkans. The Silk Roads is a major reassessment of world history from antiquity to the modern day. It has received dazzling, very well-deserved reviews, has been Book of the Day in The Guardian, Book of the Week in The Times, and has topped bestseller lists around the globe. We're honored also to be joined by Dame Avril Cameron and Professor Robert Moore to discuss and respond to Peter's book. Short intros uh, on both. Dame Avril Cameron was warden of Keeble College from 94 to 2010, and before that, Professor of Late Antique and Byzantine History at KCL. She held a Leverhulme Emeritus Fellowship in the Faculty of Theology, 2011 to 13, and she is now Chair of the Oxford Centre for Byzantine Research. Professor Robert Moore is Professor Emeritus of History at Newcastle University. He has a strong interest, as I think many here do today, in world history. And he specializes also in medieval history and has written several influential works on the subject of heresy and has received also many awards. He is fellow of the Royal Historical Society, as I believe Avril is also. So the format is that Avril and Bob will share their thoughts on Peter's book, after which Peter will respond and they will open to, uh, to all of you for, for some Q&A. This is very concentrated, very distilled. We aim to be out of here by two. Okay, so it gives me great pleasure to hand over to Carol Cameron. Thank you. It's so big. <laughs> it's a very big book. Well, I may or may not need to, need to look at it. Um, well, I'm very pleased to be here, and um, I think what Torch does is wonderful, so very good. I haven't written a speech, but I, and I'm not going to really raise questions so much as give you some impressions. And um, my first impression on, well, first, I'd seen the lovely cover, um, and it really is a very beautiful cover, everyone thinks so. But <laughs> when I actually saw the book, I was very surprised because it's huge. And I hadn't realised, I talked to Peter a bit about it, but I hadn't realised that it was really going to go from Alexander all the way up to 2014, which is pretty amazing. Uh, so it's very ambitious. And one of the things I like about it is the way that it's constructed. Uh, I wish I could have thought of that, because it has 25 chapters. Every chapter is called The Road to Something. Very clever. And at the end of every chapter, you have a little pointer to the subject of the next chapter, because it manages to do two very difficult things at the same time. It manages to be diachronic with this huge chronological sweep and thematic. And I would also say geographical, but I'll, I'll say a second a word about that in a minute. But uh, thematic, because somehow he's managed to give each chapter not only a chronological um, limit and, and scope, but also a subject. And, and yet they fit together. Now, I think that's quite a tour de force. Um, the geographical sweep of the book, it's called The Silk Roads, and it goes 
I think it's fair to say you take a wide uh, definition of Silk Roads. It goes from uh, Mesopotamia, Middle East, all the way across uh, through the Caucasus, across the steppes to the border of China. Uh, but it takes in Russia uh, when it needs to, it takes in Europe when it needs to. It's, it's very wide, if not in the entire world. So it's very wide. And the later chapters, which are the modern part, have a lot to say about Iran. He now calls it Iran. Earlier in the book, he called it Persia. Um, Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan, um, the Caucasus and Russia, and all those things that we are worrying about. I think you'd say the focus is on connectivity. It's a word people are using at the moment. So it's how things, places, um, states, interests link together. And it's about networks as well. So one of the themes that runs through it is how um, the great powers, variously defined, were always interested and still are in the these countries and this, this region and, and the products of the region. And there's a, a special emphasis on what is produced by the, the societies, the cultures, and the states along the Silk Road, broadly defined. So, um, for example, silk, of course, but not just silk, furs, slaves, gold and silver, um, and then moving towards wheat, a very interesting chapter about wheat in southern Russia. I thought that was terrific because you, you advanced the view that the um, Hitler's <coughs> invasion of the Soviet Union was very much about food supply, about the wheat from the, the areas of southern Russia, which are great wheat producing regions. Um, and then uh, moving forward into our own day, oil, of course, oil since the beginning of the 20th century, First World War, and gas. Um, and so it, it does fit together. I think this is uh, very, very difficult to maintain cohesion over so many pages, five and a half, 550 pages or so. Um, without notes, I think. You were going to say five and a half thousand, weren't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't know what I, was to say. <laughs> I stopped myself. Um, but you were talking about flows. So, of course, the products, these products, flow east to west, but then others flow from west to east. For example, money, cash, bullion. The bullion coming from the New World um, flowed towards these areas because it went to Europe and then the European empires spent it there and they exercise their ambitions in the east. So there's, there's a sense of toing and froing and uh, through the book um, in terms of different kinds of flows, but not just in one direction, in both directions. And I think, you know, we're very aware of the visit of the Chinese president today and um, thinking about exactly that sort of thing. So it's, it's a very relevant book. And surprise, surprise, you actually quote from uh, Xi Jinping in 2013, the speech that he made about the new Silk Roads. And here we are, and now we're talking about the Silk Roads. Um, I won't say much about this book as an example of world history, because perhaps Bob Moore is going to do that, but and I'm not a world history person. But um, it is subtitled A New History of the World, so, um, it, but it's not comparative. I think that's interesting. Um, a lot of um, uh, books that I have read that cover big areas and, and very different states tend to be comparative, but it, it's not comparative. It's, it's definitely diachronic <coughs> and, and thematic, as I said. Um, one of the questions it raises is, is there continuity in history? Is it always about the same sorts of things? Um, we don't want to think about teleology, we don't want to think about history repeating itself, but there are certain themes that can be recognized. And I think Peter has a very delicate touch here, because you don't try and hammer home a heavy sort of lesson, you, um, and yet you allow these uh, thoughts to come through to the reader as he or she goes through it. So I think that's, uh, that's very, very valuable. 
And I like the writing. It's lively. It's informal. You use words like spooked, for example. And um, I wrote down a few. It's very fast. The chapters are short. That's a good idea. I tend to write long sentences, long paragraphs, long chapters. Very bad idea. Write short chapters. <laughs> um, but I wrote down a few lovely quotes that the this area um, is the central nervous system of the world, like that. Um, that um, the Crusades were a harpoon. I particularly like that. They sort of got their, you know, um, whatever harpoons have into it. Um, you have a very good chapter, uh, not a chapter, but a paragraph or so about Marx writing about the Crimean War, which I thought was very well noticed. Um, you have Xi Jinping in 2013 talking about the new Silk Roads. And you have lots of maps. Uh, some of them are a bit complicated. But the map of the pipelines <coughs> is a very, very good one um, towards the end. That's relevant for now. Uh, and after all, pipelines are very much what it's about uh, nowadays and have been for quite a long time. So just to wind up, um, some of the themes. The overarching theme, I suppose, is this, this region which, um, you know, for uh, convenience perhaps, but also to, uh, through an imaginative way, you, you, you call the Silk Roads, but it's much, much more than that. This region has always been and still is a source of wealth and power. And for that reason, other states who think themselves powerful want to get their hands on it somehow and have an access to that. Um, you talk about the great game. Well, we think about the great game in terms of, you know, uh, diplomacy and so on um, between the great powers. But the great game simply represents the, the, uh, the competing efforts of major states to involve themselves, interfere with, gain from this enormously rich area. And it's played out in the middle of the medieval period, it's played out in the early modern period, it's played out today, and it was played out in the 19th century. Um, the impact of oil, I've mentioned already, um, and the Operation Barbarossa and the, the, the search for food supply and wheat. I think it's a book that's hard to, cla to classify because it's a new way of writing history. And um, it, I really admire, admire that very much. It, it, it will give rise to all kinds of questions and comments on, or criticisms probably, of individual parts. You know, why didn't you cite this source? Why have you cited that source? Uh, but you do cite an incredible amount of difficult to access material over a very long period, during which the available sources differ and change very, very dramatically. And of course, you should remember that Peter did Russian as an undergraduate, so I think that that gives it a flavor as well, because it gave you access to uh, a lot of Russian sources that other people wouldn't have been able to use. Um, so I think just finally, um, my own sort of area, Rome, the Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire, and even the Ottoman Empire, they sort of fall into place. They don't, uh, in this great narrative, have a very major role. And I think that's rather interesting. So some of us um, Byzantinists would like to promote Byzantium all the time, and we do our best to do it. Uh, but I was quite struck by the way that the Ottoman Empire um, also fell into place, because the Mediterranean, the Western-looking um, empires and the Mediterranean empires are a different story. Of course there is overlap, of course there is um, connection, connectivity between them, but this is a much bigger story, it's a much longer story, and I really enjoyed it a lot. Great. <laughs> can't resist adding to Avril's list of the endless beauties and delights in, in um, Pete's book uh, the account from Homes and Gardens in 1938 <laughs> of the chic alpine villa 
uh, of a fashionable German politician, um, which is an absolute delight mm -hmm. and ex quite extraordinarily revealing, like yeah. so many of those nuggets with which your book is studied. Thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, this is really not only a very interesting book, I think it's a very important book, and it's wonderful to have an opportunity to discuss it with you. The most, for me, the main reason why it's so important is that the biggest failing, I think, of the history of professional historians in the century and a half or so that we've been professional historians is that we have entirely been unable to prevent a relentless separation between the history that we do and the history that the rest of the population not only reads, but thinks and has framed its thoughts. And the chasm that has opened steadily and increasingly rapidly between serious history and what I have to call popular history, although I hate the <coughs> condescension of that phrase, but history for people who are not specialists, the way in which that chasm has galloped uh, away, especially in recent decades, uh, I think is both frightening and very dangerous. Um, and Peter has shown, and it's something which very, very few people have been able to do, although quite a lot of us have tried, um, he has shown that it is possible for serious history to be popular and for popular history to be serious. I think we all owe him a huge debt just for that. As I said, I think the main responsibility that we have uh, in, uh, as historians doing that is to try to shape uh, or provide a frame uh, in which people can make sense uh, of some kind, and try to make their sense of the world in which we live. It's not, in my view, uh, <coughs> to reinforce anybody's identity uh, or to um, parade anybody's values. It's to help people to make sense of what there is. And over the last 30 years particularly, this has become an increasing problem because until that time, through the whole of the life of professional history, we all knew, professional and lay, and in every part of the world, with some exceptions, but eccentrics like Karl Marx, not people who really counted, um, <laughs> we all knew that the, the story of history was the history of the rise and achievements of Europe and the ways in which it had, Europeans had transformed the world. Um, and Serious historians, academic historians, have begun to learn over the tw last 20 years or so that that is not a good way uh, of thinking about history. Uh, it's been a bit of a struggle for some, uh, but they're getting there. But they haven't got very far in providing an alternative, which means that the rest of the world is left floundering around in what seems to me to be increasingly obsolete and very often dangerous half-truth, sensationalism, <coughs> triviality, and the rest of it. Um, Peter has set an example in that. And he's also, as Avril said, uh, shown us oh, one way, I'm sure it will not be the only way, but it is a very good and interesting way uh, of suggesting how that frame can be constructed. There are three aspects of it that I would particularly like to recommend to you. The first, of course, is the one uh, that he uh, presents as his main theme. It's the, uh, it's the space. It's where it starts. It's the notion that one can make an astonishing range of history. I'm not quite sure whether the whole of world history, but that's a small part, uh, can, can be made sense of if one takes one's stance in that region between the eastern shores of the Mediterranean and the Himalayas, um, and looks in all directions as well from there. Um, that is something that the world very much learns to need to do, and Peter makes it a great deal easier than it was before. The second uh, one, uh, which I welcome more warmly perhaps than 
some of you might, more warmly possibly even than Peter himself does, uh, is that he is, he is very clear that our history, the history of the world we live in now, began about 1,500 years ago. Um, and it ca cannot be shorter. Uh, we'd all welcome that. Uh, we can't make sense of the world if we start any time much after 500 or so AD. But he also uh, shows that you don't actually have to uh, make it very much longer. He does very deftly, as Avril mm. said, um, begin with Alexander and uh, um, do some very quick scene setting in his first mm. chapter. But the real laying of the foundations uh, is from the 5th century, 6th century onwards. Uh, particularly brilliantly, I thought, on the Sassanids in Sassanid Persia, and how important they are in every dimension. And his third technique um, is the one which Avril has already drawn attention to. Again, I think it is very important that he has found a way of resolving the problem that all historians have, uh, of how we reconcile narrative and analysis. History has to be narrative, because that's the way it happens in chronological sequence. And if, if one doesn't tell it that way, uh, people won't listen uh, and they won't understand. And yet, uh, it is so difficult to do that and at the same time to maintain a serious level of analysis which makes it comprehensible and makes sense. And the the Silk Road, the, the Rhodes idea, uh, which Avril described so, so, so well, is a, a lovely way of doing it. It seems to me to have an intellectual relationship, as it were, uh, to another very interesting, though infinitely less readable and accessible uh, account of, of world history uh, of 20 or so years ago, uh, K. N. Chaudhry's Asia Before Europe. Mm. Um, which contains large sections setting out in what many thought, especially many historians thought, unnecessary and pretentious, not to say baffling detail, the ways in which he was using set theory as a guide to the writing of history. I thought it was an interesting experiment, but it was a minority view. Uh, nevertheless, it's a splendid, it's a splendid book. And it's one which, as it were, brackets Peter's book because it uses uh, the Indian Ocean uh, as, the, uh, as, as the base from which uh, the history of much of the world can be surveyed and brought together. Mm -hmm. But the point about his idea of, of, of about sets, I think, is, as it were, an, an abstruse way of stating what Peter has done with splendid concreteness and practicality uh, by making each of his steps uh, an, an analytically directed by a particular kind of phenomenon. Uh, and it's, it's very cleverly done. That being so, uh, one question that I will leave behind, though only briefly, is where we go from here, uh, where we might go from here. Uh, because even this book doesn't settle all problems. And one that uh, I found myself with from time to time as I read it is the old one that's very familiar to all world historians, which again Avril touched on. That is how we discuss the relationship between history in movement, which is very often, I mean, the, the history of, the history of, popula of population movements, the history of warfare, of long distance trade and so on, and on the other hand, uh, of, of sedentary history, of people who uh, sit in relatively comfortable places and produce things to be exchanged. Um, and Peter certainly doesn't ignore that problem, uh, and he's very he's he's very good at. Um, weaving in the sedentary civilizations as he goes. But I suspect that he wouldn't quarrel with me even so if I said that the one elephant in his room, in, in, in his room, is China. 
um, because China doesn't appear anywhere in the Silk Roads as having started anything. Mm. It plays a very important role as a source of wealth, uh, both as importing and exporting at various times. It plays an important role diplomatically, particularly in relation uh, to, the, uh, to the Silk Roads. Uh, it plays a very important role culturally, but nothing starts in China. And that seems to me to, to raise really quite an interesting question, not one that I had given thought to um, until he <coughs> put it in my head. Um, but it, to answer it, we do start uh, to need, for example, to consider whether the pillaging of China um, by the Mongols, which is wonderfully described, really started just like that, or whether some have suggested it was itself a consequence uh, of collapse within China of very sophisticated uh, economic and institutional systems, and also of the Chinese system of diplomacy uh, for keeping balance among the uh, the various frontier peoples uh, who acted as a kind of dip barrier against such groups as the Mongols. And that raises questions about uh, all sorts of interactions that I think we need somehow or other uh, to, get, to get into our picture. Um, as we need to get uh, not only the Mongol Empire, Manchu, and, and so on. I don't want to I, w I won't go on about that or press that further, but I think that it is one of the many importances of this book that it does not only achieve a great deal in itself, but also suggests an agenda which we should be taking very seriously. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed. I think anybody who writes a book or finishes an article has that sort of out of body experience. So when you see it, published and holding in front of you and it's an even <coughs> stranger experience when you have some of your intellectual heroes sitting alongside um, saying generous and kind things about it and for, for any author there's a dislocation between a book that I finished about a year ago I suppose and for me it's a sort of almost almost closed and everyone else is now discovering it so it's it's that it's a very strange uh, out-of-body sensation of people talking about ideas that, that we've had and that process that all of us do as academics of being left with nothing but a pencil, a pen and a laptop and to produce ideas that engage people. It's, it's something that I'm deeply humbled by that, that so many people are, are reading and talking about, about the book. Well, so I'm not entirely sure what the best, um, best response to those comments are, but I mean, I think I should maybe say something about the approach about what, what triggered me and what got me started, because um, I'm, uh, you know, we, 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 I work in a university here with some of the finest minds in the world, and any given day, whether it's at Torch or any of the other research centres or lectures, you can come and hear people talk about uh, incredible topics in immense detail and so by some of the, the be best subjects in the world. And one of the things I found both interesting and also very frustrating uh, when I began my doctoral research and even as an undergraduate was um, how you can't go to more, there, are, there aren't more hours in the day. You can't join these <laughs> dots together. And I think that process that, that Averill talked about, about connectivity and putting, putting a jigsaw into place is something that we find difficult in the humanities. Uh, I think that in sciences, that dialogue can be, I'm no, I don't think every, the grass is always greener, but those sorts of discussions about how people learn and work from each other, either on the specifics or on the big picture, is something that we don't, we, we're not necessarily set up that well to do here. And um, I worked that out early, because when I came here to do my DPhil on the Byzantine Empire, um, I was focused, like any Byzantinist, on the city of Constantinople, where there's a constant magnetic draw to engage with the West, to engage with the Mediterranean, to compare and contrast Constantinople with ancient and imperial Rome, and to an extent, depending on what period you're looking at, about the relationship, which is a complicated one, with the Greek-speaking world, the Greek heritage of Byzantium. But the more, that you, more time you spend looking at Constantinople, the more you realise that you are actually sitting in a, 
in the heart of something, maybe not quite the heart, I've, I've dislocated it maybe slightly, but that, that world out to the east that we do not look at, uh, it's not important within our cultural baggage, it's not important within, with our, within our intellectual histories, that world of the Caucasus, of Persia, of the Arabic-speaking world, through to the Pacific coast of China, where from a Constantinopolitan point of view, 25 years ago when I came here, and you realise you're dealing with sources that can extend from Iceland and the Straits of Gibraltar, right the way through the Balkans, uh, through the steppes, the whole way east, that you realise that there is a world, there is a jigsaw to assemble. There are puzzles which are interesting in their own right, but also how these different elements all fit together. And in a way, I can see my own continuity, uh, why I'm standing here today, because as a, as a boy, I, had, I start the book with, with a map that I had on my room at home when I was a little boy. And it never crossed my I mean, I always struggled to understand why it was that we were only being taught about things that happen in one small part of the world, as many of you know and recognise too. That, that, that story of Europe's certainty of, it, of our enlightenment, of our intellectual achievements, that celebration of places like Oxford and Cambridge, it seems so well and clearly linked back to ancient Rome, ancient Athens, and so on. To, uh, uh, and there was no word given to other parts of the world that, uh, that, as I carried on studying, became increasingly central. Places like Herat, Bukhara, Samarkand, and so on. Places that most people can't necessarily locate on a map, uh, but were the intellectual centres of the world a thousand years ago. And telling the story of these places was one of the aims, I think, that I tried to set out. But some of, I think an important part of it, another elephant in the room, is that um, uh, kneecapping of our, of our European history. And now many of you I know work on different parts of the world uh, in great detail. And one of the things I've tried to do is to stand back and try to unite lots of different parts of research. One of the things I think we have, again, a problem as academic historians is that we work in quite deep silos, um, not just overlooking each other's work, but for us to say something interesting, we need to go into greater and greater and greater detail. And it's quite difficult, I think, to stand back and treat sources uh, with the sort of care and attention and delicate touch that one needs because you know, we can spend, and as many of you will do, spend uh, our entire academic careers working on one text. I could certainly have spent the whole of my career working on just on the Alexiad, an incredibly elaborate, very complicated, wrong-footing source written in the 12th century <coughs> in Constantinople, where there is so much that you can squeeze out of individuals, sections, chapters, words, that the difficulty is to stand back and try to apply that same humility of how do you approach a source that I know you know, backwards. I translated for Penguin Classics. I should know it better than almost anybody. And I'm aware that I could keep on working just on that. How do you approach sources from different materials, different languages, with the same degree of care? And I think that that's a question that we as historians uh, need to work out how to address. How do, we, how do we include and bring in materials within our tent while retaining the, uh, the, 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 the care of being able to, to know what we're dealing with, rather than just cherry pick um, things that fit into the picture? Um, but when I was a boy and I looked at the map, one of the first questions I asked was uh, uh, my parents was why was it that if Europe was so fantastic that Alexander the Great, <coughs> it never crossed his mind to turn left? <laughs> <laughs> what was it about this sweep that constantly draws everybody eastwards? What, what, what is it about our religions that they either originate or they collide and reshape, borrow from each other, jostle in these networks, this cauldron, this heart of the world? which could have been another way, I think, uh, another way of calling the book, you know, sort of the heart, the centre of the world. But why is it that, whether it's from China, that, uh, or, from the or from Europe, or from North Africa, the Indian Ocean, what is this magnetic draw that leads humans to have the same fulcrum where um, ideas are shaped, exchanged, and so on? Our languages all collide. They're the Semitic languages and in collide with Indo-European, broadly in this sort of cauldron in the middle the Altaic languages and the Sino-Tibetan. Uh, everything seems to happen in this part of the world that should, of course, be called uh, the Mediterranean. But in our, in our uh, triumphalist telling of the past, the Mediterranean, the centre of the world, is expropriated and placed in the middle of our, our consciousness. And of course, when we talk about the Mediterranean, we don't even talk about the Mediterranean properly because we actually almost exclusively mean so I apologise to those for whom your exceptions to this rule. We ex exclusively mean the European part of the 
um, the Mediterranean. We don't include North Africa within that sort of cauldron. <coughs> and we generally exclude the Balkans and then cherry pick time points where we might look at Asia Minor, the, Middle e the Eastern Mediterranean and so on. So even our concept of the centre of the world, as we call it, is regionally limited. And I think it's interesting that that's mirrored by, by China's name for itself, Zhongguo, that this means the same, the middle of the earth. And I suppose it's, it's instructive that everybody thinks that their culture is the most important one, that their history is what really matters. And again, providing some sort of distance back to that, what, what I think was, mo what was quite, what I've enjoyed in a way with the writing a book like this, is to be able to uh, cherry pick actually what I've left out, I think is almost more interesting in some ways than what I put in. And uh, you know, I think that in today's global world, and again, apologies to those working on the normal conquest, you know, if you're growing up in Shanghai or in Damascus, in difficult circumstances, or in Moscow uh, or Sao Paulo, then perhaps the normal conquest of 1066 is not a significant world event. Whereas how the world recovers from epidemics or how big units are created when there is a dislocation of currency exchanges or how climate events can impact, let's say, the rise of the Mongols or the consolidation on the steppes, that there is a lot more muscle memory in terms of what history can do that perhaps we sometimes uh, are able to see because we're so close up to that picture working on s in such fine detail. And I, I'm aware it's a very ambitious thing to try to stand back and, and I, I, I'm so far been lucky not to have be, uh, been, uh, been challenged. I, I, I hope actually <coughs> that there are challenges to specific parts of the book, that there are ways in which it prompts questions because the role of any historian is not to write a perfect book that gets some sort of biblical status and is sacrosanct, it's to try to challenge new questions to be asked. I mean, I'm much less interested in have you cited this source rather than that source, or are you aware of the latest research, because you can't, you can't win those kinds of battles. But in terms of trying to look at big, qu big questions in slightly different ways, in terms of that connectivity, that jigsaw, how it all fits together, um, you know, I really hope that that's what happens because you know one, one of the first things I read as a boy was 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 Brodel, and, and saying that the role of a historian, the role of history, is to, uh, role of historian is to be ambitious, because what is the point going to the library unless you're going to go and dig in and, and really bite into something that is too big to bite into? And I can tell you, I can promise you, there were many occasions where I thought that I both couldn't and shouldn't be trying to write a book like this, and then wincing when I was told that, that, that my publishers thought a new history of the world would be an appropriate one. Because of course it's absolutely right, there are parts of the world that get less gloss than other scholars might want to give them. There are parts that are absent actually, and not, not just through the, um, the selection process of deliberately leaving them out, but because you can't fit everything in. But in terms of what does world history look like here in 2015, or the beginning of the 21st century, where we have a lot of work going on in Oxford in trying to understand world history, looking at new regions, trying to shed light on people's places, locations that have connections with other, other locations. Typically, they have connections, connections with the West and the Western world, Western Europe. But I think that there is a post-colonial voice now. There is a post-Western voice where understanding uh, the Arabic-speaking world, Russia, China, Central Asia, uh, Persia or Iran, uh, and the Gulf, peoples who have um, impacts not just in their energy productions and their fossil fuels, but, but a whole hosts of different materials and commodities that we need to have access to, and those dislocations in, in uh, Syria, in Iraq, in uh, Ukraine as well, uh, the reorientation of Iran and being welcomed back in, in some shape or form <coughs> into a global community, the rejigging of how Israel looks at the world around it. I think if you were to ask the questions of um, Professor Moore, Professor Cameron, um, Professor Burma, what, what they would, how they would see this world on the basis of their experience, they, like most people, would try and run for the door. But if, w if we locked the door and forced them to sit and answer, I think you would have a much greater sense, because the textures of how we would think about things, about what happens to the Byzantine Empire when it's put under great military pressure, what happens when there are um, voices that rise, whether they are right to claim an identity or right to be described as having a religious identity. Things like ISIS, where the role of religion is not as simple as perhaps it's described in the, in the press, where religion is used as a cipher to attract all sorts of different elements. Actually, our historians should have a much greater impact in trying to have their voices heard. And it's, it's I think, something of great surprise to me, having been an academic now for uh, more than two decades,
how little engagement there really is with what, what it is that we do with the outside world. Some of that may be our own fault, but I think some of it is also the fact that if you go into any bookshop, the appetite for new books is relentlessly about tanks in Western Europe on the, or in the Second World War, or British spies, or these things that we feel very comfortable with. And that point where history becomes myth, I think, as, as, as Professor Moore said, is, is potentially very dangerous, particularly at a, at a moment where our engagement with the outside world uh, may, maybe matters more than it, than it ha ever has done. And, and the humility we need to have in, in working out what kind of questions we have been uh, unable to answer and unwilling to answer. So I hope that um, those of you who have read the book or uh, will have enjoyed it, those who will read the book will enjoy it. I can't promise sweets for everybody. There's, they're bound to be personal preferences. But I think that the, the aim has not been to try to throw a stone through the window of current history and to sort of uh, draw attention to, to how we should do things. It's not a challenge. It's not a red rag to, to, to provoke. But I think it's trying to look at some of those comfortable truths that we accept and to challenge them and to stress test them and to look at how maybe the world does hang together in, the, in, a, in, a, in, an, in, in, a, in an unusual way. And I, I leave you with, I suppose, a, a, just a thought, which is that uh, the ancient world were obsessed about trying to contextualise the world around them as a, as a human body. And I think if I had no idea about medicine, and I don't have a great deal of idea about medicine, I, I would have no idea what my organs did or that there are veins that connect everything and create a continuity and create an integrity. And I've been trying to look at things like neuroscience and plant science in the last couple of months when I've had a bit of free time to finally purge myself of trying to worry about China or whatever it might be. And trying to see just how connected this world is around us, this cosmos that we are part of, that there are patterns that we can find and look for. And I think that there are interesting ways that history can learn from science. So that, that map of the Silk Roads corresponds, I think, to global airline networks where you see these nodes that connect to each other, some stronger connections than others, some are more important than others. I use a, 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 a theme in the book a few times about the, the cities of Asia being strung like pearls. But that connectivity mirrors actually how the human brain is wired or animal brains are wired. It mirrors how all sorts of things that we are unaware of, uh, these connections that we take for granted or don't even see, that maybe there are ways in which uh, there's greater congruity to our common human past than perhaps we, um, we like to. That's a bit more metaphysical. I I'd like to talk about Hitler's Alpine Chalet, uh, <laughs> which is more interesting. But uh, I think on that one, I'll sit down and, and any questions. prompted a move to um, to opening out to you, the audience, and um, and asking uh, questions uh, that you may have from your reading or that have bubbled up in the course of the discussion. Thanks very much uh, for those comments um, to all three of you. Um, are there any questions? Yes, over here, please. Thank you. It's certainly worth it my appetite to read the book. Um, I was wondering if you'd like to comment, and perhaps with examples from the past, I'm very conscious of the present and the type of the Silk Roads, we might be calling it the Steel Roads today, um, of the uh, impact um, of the uh, Chinese steel, uh, uh, and then you're doing the local history of Scunthorpe or Botherham or somewhere. Um, I've an example from Leeds, uh, where the tank, mentioning tanks, and tanks all on order for the Shah. The Shah goes. What do you do? So I don't know. The examples, you know, going back of that, we're focused on local history or whatever, and yet there's a global history coming right in, you know, to our localities. Shall, shall I? Uh, well, I. <coughs> Uh, rather than cherry pick examples, I suppose that as, a, as having looked at, ha trying to look at history in the big sweep, one of the things it tells you is that your past, like, a, like, like buying shares, is no indication of your future. And uh, the world is littered with cities that were once dominant, whether that's uh, Istanbul, maybe Constantinople, maybe rising again, you know, its population of 23, 24 million, Turkey has an interesting role. But, you know, when we walk around Venice, uh, we see, which for most of us, we see a city that was once at the centre of a whole series of network, and that that process of uh, of fall is, I suppose, something that that is part of the rhythms of our of the world we live in. 
uh, you know, I have a slightly bearish view about the world around us. I think that Western Europe, it's on balance likely, I'm not a future gazer, but I say likely that our next 400 years won't be quite as good as our last 400 years. You know, I'd have thought that we had, a, we had a particular moment in the sunshine, as other cultures, civilizations, regions have had in the past, for a specific set of circumstances. But as, a, as I, I, wouldn't, I, you know, I don't like the words and labels of economic, economic historians, or even I don't even know what the difference is between the, different, the faculties we establish in universities and talking about theology, economics, whatever. But what I think a, 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 the right way of looking at the world is where are their resources? who controls those, and where are their appetites and abilities to pay for those. And in that sense, the steel uh, prices, which have a dramatic impact on one side of the world and uh, 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 being used on another, shows again that, that how interconnected we really are. I, I think our problem, in whether it's in Redcar and the steelworks or um, uh, with the Chinese uh, dumping their steel prices, is that we are powerless to be able to control all of those kinds of things. One of the, one of the th I think one of the things I, I try to talk about in the book is to, to explain or to try to look at Europe's uh, past history about why is it that we managed to become so successful. And part of the explanation, I think, for that probably will also lie at the heart of our decline. You know, one of the things that I think <coughs> we were singularly good at was um, systemizing violence. You know, Europe as a cauldron of violent exchange is something that comes very clearly when set alongside even major dislocations like the Mongol invasions. I don't have any illusions that these were not uh, without their uh, streets running with blood, even if one stands a little bit back from the Persian sources. But I think that there is that, that constant question about who controls the resources, and the further you are away from those, the greater likelihood <laughs> that you shrivel. You know, and that's the same story if you're in Byzantine Constantinople, if you're in Rome, Rome of the, uh, of the fourth and fifth century AD, that you can't always fight against the sway of what's coming against you. So I think it, on, a, on a human level, that story of the steel works, it's deeply painful in terms of how we can stop the Chinese selling steel at their price or buying them. You know, I think it's, this is a moment of profound reorientation where cultures, empires sometimes at the door, the sun sets on them. Pretty bit bleak. Mm -hmm. uh, Bob, Avril, would you like to respond at all? Well, I, yeah. <coughs> what came into my head as you were just speaking was, um, you know, there are parallelisms, I think, between global history, as you have presented it in this book, and globalisation. You know, globalisation, we, uh, and, and I think it's a lot of, uh, the, it's very important how how things are described, what language you use, and what what uh, labels we put on things, and um, y you're you're unpicking a lot. But um, if we we adapt our terminology somewhat, we can see all these similarities as well. Yeah. Yes. Yes, in the front, please. Um, <coughs> I'm, I'm afraid I haven't read the book either. But we we did hear the comment that there's a sort of uh, start point um, at about 500 AD uh, with some reference backwards. I wonder how you, uh, th that's rather different from someone like Jared Diamond writing about the determinants <coughs> of what happens, of what eventually becomes what, what you might call mm -hmm. civilization, um, going back a, a much, much further than that. Is, is, is that a viewpoint that you disagree with, or is it one that you uh, uh, think squares with your... Well, three things, and then I'm going to let Professor Moore, because he, he's the one who says it starts at 500, which is news to me. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, I think in the first instance, uh, you know, it's how long is a piece of string, I think there's, right, you know, I've read um, Sapiens, where, you know, you can, we, we, of course you could go back to, you know, the, the dawn, of, dawn of human history, and I think at some point it's where, where's the relevance in, in so on. So I think that that's, you have to start somewhere, and I thought Alexander the Great is, is a cipher. I, again, it's absolutely right, I'm setting a scene for things that accelerate. But partly you have to follow where the, where the literary sources are, and it's great to have a, a, a discussion of the archaeological evidence, but that's quite limited, particularly in this, these parts of the world, for all sorts of reasons. Um, but then the third one, you know, what I would say about an author like Jared Diamond and talk about serious history being made popular is that it's very dangerous, I think. You know, there's no monopoly that historians have, whether they're academics or, you know, or not. 
There's no monopoly we have on controlling and being able to read. Uh, but there is a discipline that we try and teach our students here of how you understand and interpret sources. And scientists can have a, a very unfortunate habit of taking historical, those truisms and those truths, in inverted commas, at face value. And how the world looks if you're writing about it from the point of view of North America in the 21st century, where that line of history looks absolutely solid and straight without investigating, it means that potentially when you're selling as many millions of books as he actually does and has the audience that he does, you, you, this is the kind of history I think that Professor Moore means can be incredibly dangerous because it's, it's, it's unfiltered and it's unscientific as well. I hope he's not listening. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I mean, one can write history perfectly, properly, legitimately <coughs> on all kinds of scales. Um, some people, David Christian, would, 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 uh, would have us write it from the Big Bang onwards. Uh, and by doing so, uh, he raises up, he can produce a lot of it interesting and worthwhile questions. Um, so I, uh, I, don't, I don't think there's any conflict. I think the question is choosing the right scale for the job in hand. And the job in hand that I was particularly directing attention to uh, now was that of producing a, a framework for what we living in the world now should can, can regard as our, if you like, our immediate past, uh, the history of which we are the products and by which we've been shaped. Uh, and of course, uh, there is never discontinuity. You can always go further back. But it, it, it does seem to me, and I hope that I didn't uh, do Peter wrong in, in reading his book as <laughs> tending to support my view, uh, that that history, which we which we want to put out there, does start, uh, or at least yeah. is is best started uh, around 500 or, mm. or so. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Um, you described um, the central nervous system of the world as being Eurasia and the centre of Eurasia, so the Balkans and that kind of area. But I was wondering whether you think that the discovery of the Americas might have shifted the center of gravity of the world and made that view less normal, more sort of nuanced. It's a very good question. I think that it's absolutely right that the normal reaction of historians is to see that the discovery of the new world weakens that central nervous system. In fact, in many ways, it strengthens it because, uh, as, uh, as, as we've already said, that w the wall of bullion that comes out of the Americas, uh, it rejigs the center of Europe. It makes Europe find, for the first time, particularly the west of Europe, it puts it in the center of the world. Uh, but as a clearinghouse for South American, whether it's, um, or particularly South American, um, gold and silver taken from, uh, well, Aztecs and then Inca, but also from mines in like Potosi, in Bolivia, um, that wall of cash is basically recycled out of w Europe to buy products from the Far East, from China particularly, but also from India. And in India, what happens is that that, wall, that, that flow of cash that is suddenly very, very <coughs> accelerated strengthens connections into Central Asia, into the heart of the world. So for example, I mean, that's why the, 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 the Mughal Empire expands at exactly that point with Bavur, who starts to build aggressively in his descendants in classic Central Asian Timurid style. So when we look at Humayun's tomb or the Taj Mahal, we see these as jewels of Indian workmanship and style, but actually these are, these are entirely recognizable Central Asian models. So that, that center of Asia, Become stronger as a result of the Silk Road, uh, a result of the Americas. What then happens, though, and I think that does ask questions about, well, the, uh, awkward questions about the, the, the China and so on, is that by and large, those people who normally arrive as traders, as the Western Europeans did, armed with money, uh, are very quick to establish. Um, uh, secure trading positions, they then start to try and get concessions on their trading positions that lock in their competitive advantage against other rivals. And then normally, uh, as happens in, in the case of Western Europe in, in the Far East and in India, um, you then start to, to, rather than just trade with people, you start to dominate them. And then an empire is born. And that elision between trade opening the door to conquest is again something which is recognisable to all sorts of different regions, all sorts of different historians. And uh, at that point, so around about 1700, you see the Silk Roads meaning something different because suddenly cash is being cycled through Western Europe back out to India, but cash then start, and, and China, 
cash and other products start to come back in the other direction, kept under the control of Western hands. So that rhythm, it's not, it's that the Americas don't uh, dislocate world, the, the centre of the world, but it does provide a, a sort of death knell for Eastern Europe and that rise of the West. And so you know, one of the things that I can ask even you very distinguished, well-educated scholars in this room, you know, I, I'd have thought, unless you're very unusual, your knowledge of Bohemian history, history of Poland, the Balkans, Greece post the Byzantine era, or the Ottoman world would be extremely, super, you know, extremely thin and superficial. And the fact even when we talk about Europe, we're not talking about Europe, we're talking about <laughs> selected, high-lit Western parts of Europe. And that even skews how we look at things like the Second World War, where uh, you know, if you're Polish or Belarusian or uh, from Hungary, your concept of what Europe's liberation and defeat of Hitler means means something very different to where we in the West conquered tyranny and destroyed the Nazis and so on. But it, that's not how it looked where Poland, whose territory was being defended, that's why we declared war in Germany in 1939, ends up being shunted into the arms of the Soviet Union. So even things in our common European heritage, I think, can be, can need to be dislocated and fractured. I think we have time for one quick question. Let's see your hand over there. Um, thanks very much. Um, I, I, I mean, I'm interested in the way that you frame this as a um, as a story and a new story about about the world and how we how we look at it. Um, but I, I'd be interested to know, um, in in your opinion, um, who are the main characters in this new story that you're telling? Well, the great men of history. No, I'm just I'm curious. I mean. That's, and women. That, yeah, no, no, that's, I'm not, I'm not, it's not, not my words, it's the, that's what I mean. Yes, sorry, yes, I should be shot down for that. I should expect, I don't mean I think it's about great, it's the classic question is who are, where are the great men? That sort of very old fashioned way of looking at key individuals. And the truth is that perhaps individuals, whether they're men or women, have less impact on the world around us in today and in the past than, uh, than we think, but historians love to focus on great men and great women, on individuals. And what we know, in even in places like Oxford and you know, other universities and so on, is that actually it's the community that is much more important than one or more figures who may achieve prominence visibly, but actually on a day-to-day -day basis. And so one of the things that I think I, I try to suppress, actually, is to disengage from that idea of individuals being able to make things happen. And you know, it's, it's I think, no coincidence that there are, you know, one and a half thousand, there really is a one and a half thousand page book about Napoleon that's come out. The idea that, these are, that there is a history of the world where individuals are able to shape continents, shape the, you know, shape everything around them. We know that's not how things work. And, and as a Byzantinist, you'll know that too, that the relentless focus on historians to pick that up is no different a thousand years ago than it was, than it is today, partly because it achieves it, it, lots of birds with one stone to be able to have these lightning rod individuals, men, men and women. But the, the way in which you frame it as a story, I mean, a story requires characters. So if your characters aren't great men, great women, um, who are the characters in this new story that you're telling about the world? Well, as luck would have it, we're out of time. We are, we are seriously out of time. I think we should all now go and read the book and find out for ourselves. Just before, just before we end, could I draw your attention to the beautiful display of the book that Blackwells has set up outside books are for sale? And I'm sure Peter will be happy to Delight sign success. books. Yes. Um, and then um, our next Book at Lunchtime discussion is on the 4th of November in, in, a, in a fortnight's time where we'll be joined by Marina Warner, Jeffrey Lloyd, and Michael Sherrion to discuss Amy Lee's Comparative Encounters. And then finally, please join me in, in thanking Avril Cameron, uh, Robert Moore, and Peter Frankopan for a fascinating discussion. Thank you.